Good morning. Welcome to this replay. We're going to talk about maintaining language learning habits using memory palaces, how all that works, and really the long game of language learning, especially when you're using memory techniques, because it does require some discipline. And discipline, of course, is in short supply. So again, this is a replay. Welcome to it. And that's what this is about, language learning and the discipline of them with memory palaces over the long term. If you're hopping on the live, hit that thumbs up, say hello in the chat, tell me where you are, who you are, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and we're going to have a great session, do some mailbag, some Q&A, talk about the Freedom Journal as part of our habit stream, and uh, also mind mapping. Um, I shared a longer video about mind mapping uh, using this book, The Diary, of a bookseller to talk about this procedure of mind mapping, which is part of that actual habit structure. If you have multiple tools that you can go to, be it the Freedom Journal or a mind mapping or whatever the case may be, then you're going to have a much better chance of maintaining your habit over time. Because if you're not uh, equipped with the tools of habit maintenance, then you're just really not going to do nearly as well as you could and there are multiple tools so we'll be talking about that in this live hit that thumbs up and let me know in the chat where you are in the world pink ribbons here and he says the mind mapping video was very interesting well thank you pink ribbon and thanks for all your comments on the various videos and replays i really appreciate that and uh, you always have very interesting things to say so please do keep that coming and if you are hopping on live hit that thumbs up and let me know where you are in the world. I always love connecting names with places, which is an important memory exercise for the geopolitical aesthetic, let's call it, of memory, which is uh, super, super powerful. In any case, the first real habit is, of course, showing up, right? And when you show up, you get results, even if you don't feel like showing up. So it's not a thing about feeling like it. If you were to follow your feelings, you'll never get anywhere because when do you feel like doing hard work or when do you feel like expending effort? Well, you feel like it when you're rewarded and when you're rewarded as quickly as possible. And the wonderful thing about showing up and getting that reward is that you do get the instant quick victory feeling of reward by actually doing something. It's really a paradox but when you just get yourself started and you get going, then you get that reward. So it's, it's really interesting, but you've got to get into the habit of actually showing up and showing up consistently to get it. And you just settle in and ah, relax. And of course you can set the stage for that by just being relaxed first thing in the day. And uh, I do that with meditation, with some stretching and breathing exercises, which we've talked about in previous videos. And uh, let's see, Pink Ribbon says, thank you for your book suggestions. Well, thank you uh, for asking about the books and please do follow up with them. This book, The Diary of a Bookseller is amazing. It is a tour de force when it comes to memory and uh, I highly recommend it. It is a book about memory and obviously on that video I talked about the mind mapping aspect but it is also about expanding your ability to see how you can record your memories, remember more, the things that are worth remembering, and just wonderful, wonderful ways that books themselves supplement the memory, community supplements memory, and so forth. And it's a, it's a actually great example here because in order to make a daily diary, you've got to show up daily, right? So this book is also really highly recommended for you to see a demonstration of a daily habit play out over a year. And it's not just about diary, keeping a diary, but it's running a business and showing up to that business, which includes social media elements like Facebook and making videos for YouTube and all that stuff. And you just, you learn so much when you read about the daily habits of other people. So I'm highly recommending this book for multiple reasons, not just because it's about memory and it is a diary, but it is about habits. It's about making things happen in the world by harnessing the power of the mind and seeing what happens through documentation and the themes that emerge over time are really, really powerful. So um, yeah, we're gonna talk about these sorts of things and uh, we'll do some mailbag as well, if that's uh, of interest. And uh, yeah, 
hit that thumbs up and you know a huge tip for you is to mind map and have really big mind maps don't make it small make it big give yourself lots of space lots of color and so forth but in any case I was off on a little bit of a vacation and you know I kept this with me the entire time and I stuck with my daily Chinese pattern and it really really worked but I was doing less and so now the question is back from vacation how do we get more how do we get this going and rolling and uh, if this is of interest to, to you hit that thumbs up let me know in the discussion um, the freedom journal does give you the freedom to be free and we talked on a previous live all about how that I'm using it so I'll refer you to that you can read and see photographs at magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash freedom dash journal and uh, <laughs> in any case the, the the trick is and this is how you really make things simple for yourself is you reduce the anxiety of decisions by having something like this right it just reminds you that you made a commitment for a hundred days to do something to show up and so here you go uh, thanks John uh, great uh, to see you um, here you go it's just there like you, you, you have a difficult time ignoring it because it's big, it's in your space, and it has the structure for you. You just show up and you fill it, fill it in, right? So I haven't done this morning yet, but I have it open to yesterday. The uh, memory palace is there, and all I need to do is turn the page and start filling it out. Now, I'm not going to do it now, but uh, after this call, I will show up for my Chinese learning. And we managed, even on vacation, Thanks to this, putting this out where it's visible on the table, can't ignore it, manage to do Chinese every day and memorize a bunch of words and even learn a, a little bit of a Chinese song, which is actually the, uh, the theme song for the Smurfs in Chinese. And uh, what we did is we made a little documentary on that. Let me know in the chat if you'd be interested in me actually editing this documentary that we shot over the day, me learning some of this song in Chinese encoding it just while we're walking around using impromptu memory palaces and uh, then testing it across the day. It'll take some some editing to get that done but uh, that's uh, gonna be interesting because it's a series of videos that show you the course of memorizing something in another language over the day. But it wouldn't have happened without having a constant reminder of this is the mission we're going to show up, we're going to do it, even on vacation. So this is the first tip that I have for you, is make it visible, make it impossible to ignore. Make your daily language learning routine, doesn't have to be this, although I highly recommend this, because of the inner workings that we talked about on that previous video, um, but something that is very, very in your face that you can't forget. And this is another reason why I just love physical books, like this book here that I'm reading now, it's just in your face. Can't forget your commitment to read in the same way. If it's an ebook and it's lost on your computer, well, you can forget that. It's buried away in some file, so um, that's crazy uh, to do that to, to literature. I, I'm more and more into freeing literature to be visible because that's how you get something like Chinese memorized is you have it in your face and it's very very visible so that's the first tip that I have for you um, is to make it undeniable make it and and the sub tip there is to make it doable to make it something that's accomplishable so this is a very small thing to memorize the entirety of it is doable it's um, it's more than doable it's it's just bunch of words right so this is uh, very 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 doable and the doableness is important r803 thanks for saying hello um, great that you were here if you're joining us live hit the thumbs up let me know where you are in the world and uh, we'll keep going but that's it that's the thing it's not just that it's it's visible but it's doable doable um, I think that that really has been useful for me because it's so easy to be tempted to say, oh, I'm gonna memorize 2,000 words and have this massive dictionary, which I did with German. And, uh, you know, it's still doable, but it, it, it certainly makes things a lot more of a challenge every day. So if you're gonna make it visible, don't make it the size of a mountain that you can't climb, but pick something that is, you know, 
doable and doable to you. I, what's doable to one person may not be doable to you, but pick the thing that is doable to you and make it visible. Tie it to your neck if you have to and get it done because there's so much joy and happiness and contentment to be had from getting things done. And uh, this was not really that heavy to carry around in my backpack the whole time. We had it at cafes, we had it everywhere, and uh, just filling it out. And it's, it's just simple. Draw a little memory palace and then have the words and the next day test, or later in the day test. There's, there's several ways to use it, um, but it's doable. And that's the important thing. And picking a doable number, like three words when you're on vacation, three phrases, maybe a bit of a song. That's doable, even on vacation. So getting back home, now the burden is to accelerate it a little bit to at home levels. And you know, you can slowly ramp up, don't have to do it all at once. And then the thing is too, is as I said before, the point is to have multiple strategies. So let's say you come to a day never really happens, but let's say that it does. You come to a day and you're like, oh my God, not another freedom journal, right? Uh, well, then I would go to mind mapping and I would mind map out a couple of words, right? Instead of doing it in a memory palace, just have some variety. And there's a lot to variety because variety creates mental release. And you know, in, in weightlifting, when you get to certain levels, you've mastered certain skills, you do need to put certain movements out to pasture for a while and then have uh, another thing that you do you vary your routines and that's how you get gains over time or whatever you're looking for greater flexibility and so forth and that's going to be a great way to ensure that you um, are able to to get gains consistently over time so that you have a better experience so make it visible and make it doable and then have variation. Those are the major tips really for you. Um, by the way, I heard that YouTube's now made it so that you can see the chat bar during the replay. So I'd be very interested in seeing if that's true. If any of you are feeling like posting some questions, I'm gonna go through some mailbag now. Um, now that we covered the three things that I wanted to talk about, about maintaining your habits. Uh, there's some more points to come, but uh, let's do some mailbag. And if you have questions, be sure to pop them in to the chat box there. And if you're just joining us, let me know where you are in the world and hit that thumbs up button to let me know you're engaged. So here's an email from Tom. He says, Anthony, I want to thank you for all that you do for us who want to improve our memory skills. I enjoy immensely your podcasts and videos. You do such a great job of providing marvelous and useful information in an entertaining and personal style that I sometimes listen to various podcasts, for instance, multiple times when I need to calm down during the last few hours of my time at work. So I get to calm down and learn something at the same time. Well, Tom, thanks, that's awesome. And yeah, I'm glad if my various productions can be re relaxing and add to calm in your life because it certainly is a, a principle I like as well, is to listen to calming things that also allow me to learn. Because there's so much noise out there and a lot of rah, 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 and like, hey guys, I got six tips for you on this video. Blah, 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 blah. You know, that's not, not particularly relaxing and you don't learn anything from it anyway. Or very little. Um, let's check in here with our chat. William says, Hi, Dr. Metivier. How is your Mandarin going? Hen hao. Uh, uh, you inspired me and gave me the ambition to learn Chinese and to challenge myself to go to China and study abroad there. Well, William, that's awesome. Thanks for letting me know. Chinese is going great. Um, as I was just saying, and you can watch the, the replay and so forth, we went on vacation and I still worked on it every day. And I used this to help make sure that I showed up because this is pretty hard to ignore when it's sitting on the table when you wake up and uh, you dis have discipline, you put it in your bag and, uh, and away you go. Um, and so I, I'm just very happy with my Chinese. Thank you for asking about it. It's just a constant pleasure, you know? Sometimes I get a little bit bored of it because I actually don't want to, I, I, here's my challenges with language learning. And it's always been the challenge and it's possibly the challenge for you as well or many people is that I just am not, I'm not really a small talk guy. I'm not a chit chat guy, you know? And so it's often a challenge to just see people in the elevator and start talking to them chit chatty wise because I have no interest in doing that in my mother tongue. 
right? And I'm, I've just been that sort of person when I show up in the room, it's like, hey, how you doing? Oh, by the way, did you see this amazing thing? And this is the most powerful idea in the world. And oh, Will Self was talking about this and all the internet is destroying everything and blah, 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 blah right? Like just going right into it. Not really a guy for, you know, warming up or anything like this. I just, that's just me in my mother tongue. And it's the same in another language. So all of these niceties, how you doing, what did you eat yesterday, and so forth, that's a real challenge for me in any language. And so that's really my number one barrier. But I can do it in Chinese, and we are cycling more and more and accelerating more and more to the things that I do, like what's going on with my blog, what's going on with YouTube, what's going on with this, that, and the other thing, my new book, my last book, my next book, et cetera, et cetera. More of the actual things that I'm doing, and then we accelerate to bigger and bigger concepts and ideas and so forth. But it all comes from vocabulary. The vocabulary tells you where to go. Um, and it's, it's, it's a balance of vocabulary and phrases and then other things that are fun, like songs and stuff like that. But ultimately the vocabulary tells you where to go when you're speaking every day because you'll find that, oh, I don't know how to say this. And then you figure out how to say that, right? So there's a lot of surprises and this is not necessarily as clean as one would like. Uh, so I do proceed alphabetically, but then something will come up and so we put that in there. Um, and it's uh, a lot of fun. Uh, but thank you for the question again. And I just, I just enjoy, I find enjoyment in Chinese. So whenever it gets challenging, whenever it gets boring, I find enjoyment in it. And I do that through songs. Uh, I love to sing in Chinese and learn new songs and challenging stuff too, right? Um, and it, it just, it opens up the mouth. And one of these things about the documentary, no one said that they were interested in that documentary. I'm not sure why, but we shot this documentary and one of the things that I was explaining in there is the importance of relaxing your mouth when you're learning a new language and speaking it. Because a lot of the, what seems to be a psychological resistance is actually just that your body is stiff and your mouth is stiff. So when we were doing some Chinese stuff, like it's just really roller coaster ride kinds of things that your mouth isn't used to. And you might think, oh, I didn't remember it. Actually, you remembered it just fine. It's just your mouth isn't used to moving in those directions and switching back and forth so quickly. So I have shown in this documentary a number of mouth exercises. So let me know if you'd be interested in that. Hit the thumbs up, post a comment, and uh, that will put some speed into producing it for you. Barry's here from the UK. Definitely be interested in your process on the Chinese song. Thanks. Okay, thanks for letting me know, Barry. We're gonna do that documentary, but basically, just very briefly, um, it's a Sai Shen de Na Bien Hai de Na Bien Yo Yi Chun Lan Jing Ling, right? And so, as we were walking along, I just started to encode it. Now, April is just telling me this, so I didn't read the characters or anything like that, and we didn't go through each and every single tone, so I didn't add, I didn't use the major method for tones, which I often do uh, when, when working out of this book, for example. Um, but I just started to pick parts of the landscape and encode on them, and then just go from there. And it's so much fun. We documented it and then tested it across the day. Now I just sang it, and I'm not even sure how exactly correct that is. I believe it's correct. But I haven't actually sung it for two days now, so I'd be very interested to watch back my own replay and see and ask April if that was good. But I'm pretty sure that was 100% correct. And you know, the whole point here is, is I take it as my goal to hear things once and memorize them and have them like that. That does, of course, require repetition, but I like to repeat from my mind, not from any external source, although external sources do come into play, and they're, they're important through writing, but my own handwriting, without ever further reference to this book, and if it is further reference to this book, it's without reference to any translation, but just the words themselves, which is a cool feature of this particular book. So you can make intelligent decisions about the books that you choose. If you speak German, which I hope you do, um, they make better language learning books than English people do. At least that's been my experience. Um, so learn German and then learn Chinese so you can use Lancashire uh, products. Um, 
in any case, thank you for the questions about Chinese and Barry, if, if uh, you have any more questions, let me know. Uh, I uh, really appreciate the, the questions and I did uh, get a question from uh, someone in email that we're going to pick up as well, but uh, alright, Carmel, thanks for all that Chinese. I haven't been studying reading Chinese, but uh, uh, ni hao, I see, xie xie, and, uh, uh, well, the rest I, well, I see, I think I see Chung Wen in there, and, uh, oh, the Wu Shi Huan, ah, interesting, well, anyway, thank you for writing in Chinese, I, I haven't been practicing reading Chinese, I did some character work, but, uh, I just decided I want to focus on oral and speaking. But I recognize a fair number of those characters, so thank you for writing in Chinese and giving me the opportunity to try. Hopefully, it's not boring to y'all, but uh, to try and uh, to to see that there. Uh, Jack says, "Hello, could you make a video in Spanish about memory palaces? I love your channel, but sometimes it is difficult for me to understand your explanations in English." Well, thanks, Jack, for being here. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, not there's no. Sp plan specifically for doing Spanish because we're at hard work on finishing the German version of the work that I do um, which is coming uh, so that uh, just stay tuned for that and then we'll tackle Spanish um, but we got to get one thing done at a time this is the power of focus if you try to do too many things at once it never gets done so uh, with with all uh, all love and respect for the Spanish speakers out there. We started with German version, and so we got to finish with that, and then we'll do Spanish. Uh, in terms of Spanish-speaking memory people that could teach you, I can recommend no one better than my friend Daniel Welsh, who uses the magnetic memory method himself. So he he has a great channel uh, that you can check out, and he has some. Uh, one of his videos on the Magnetic Memory Method is in Spanish and it's on my website, so you can uh, search Daniel Welsh for that on the site. So William says he would be very interested in this documentary, and William says sorry for all the questions. Please do not apologize for asking questions. Ask lots of questions. Hit the thumbs up if you like questions. If you like Q&A, let me know in the chat if you like this Q&A. Um, we are, of course, always responding to the world, and we follow what the world uh, has, has, has the, the, the direction, the wind that one puts under in our sails, we follow it. It pushes us, so keep them coming. And don't uh, be apologetic about it, please. So why are German language books better than English books for language learning? Well, William, I was being a little bit uh, humorous there, or trying to be. I, I don't know that that sweeping statement should be true, but one of the reasons why I find uh, what well, German precision is not a myth. There, there is a lot of precision. But I have a lot of criticisms for this book as well. But those criticisms come from how I consume language learning books more than the book itself. But uh, one of the reasons that it's very good is because it has a, uh, an index that's arranged in a particular way. And that way is very, very powerful from a memory perspective, from a memory palace perspective. It's almost, a, it's almost as if they anticipated that guys like us and people like us would be showing up for this. Um, plus, they just, there's something very, very logical about the actual uh, structure of, of the presentation of things in uh, German language books. Also, um, they're very good at monolingual dictionaries, so uh, really um, highly recommend learning German so that you can that, so that you can particularly enjoy this company. Now I don't know, maybe this company has English products. I've never looked into it, but uh, there's lots of reasons. The other reason why I, I, I like German language learning books is because I speak German and German to maintain German. A great way of learning Chinese is to learn Chinese from German books so that I'm constantly bumping into German, which I have fewer and fewer opportunities to do now that I'm living in, uh, in Australia. Uh, although while we were on our little vacation, we did hear tons of German. And I spoke with people, but 
they were strange. They just like really didn't want to speak German. They wanted to speak English. Maybe that's not strange, but uh, <laughs> in any case, I um, I did my best to to speak with them, and uh, uh, they they just spoke back to me in English. So that didn't get any of the beautiful German in my ears, um, which is regrettable. But in any case, you take your chances when you get them, and. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm really bad at small talk, so it could be that it's just the way that I try to engage in conversation that makes it uh, a losing proposition in those cases. But uh, in any case, you still try, and I, I still keep up my monthly appointments with native German speakers to keep the German going. And to maintain German is really that simple. It's just using German language books to learn the next language that I'm focusing on. When I return to, to Spanish and uh, continue on that, I already have the German language uh, books for Spanish that I would return to. Um, and, and it's just, Benny Lewis calls it the laddering technique, or at least I heard him use that term. I don't know if he invented it, but I think it's a very important term and useful. Um, so that's a great question, but uh, uh, there's no, I was being half facetious there, so uh, forgive me for trying to make a joke. <laughs> Carmel says, hello Anthony, fun to get your immediate fa feedback. I was saying I love studying Chinese and thank you too, your work is very useful for me. Well, thank you Carmel for saying so, I appreciate that. And uh, like I said, I appreciate you writing in Chinese to me um, uh, in there because it's just, it's so beautiful. And I do want to do more character study and I do do some character study uh, using the Camp Mist formula and we really got it down to memorizing the sound, the meaning, and being able to draw the character along with the correct pinyin in about five minutes per character. It's not universally so and then there would be a 95 to 98 percent retention 24 hours later in terms of drawing the character correctly, not necessarily the best penmanship but recognizably um, and uh, you know, the test here is my father-in-law, and he says, Jayo, so uh, that's cool. Uh, when I get Jayo, then I'm happy. Uh, but in any case, the correct tone, drawn in a recognizable way, and the sound and the meaning, uh, orally, and understand through understanding. So that's really great. I, I think that five minutes per character, there'll be some characters, of course, that are much more challenging, and then not all characters, of course, stand on their own. Um, Many uh, have, you know, two, and so you have to do them both. Um, but nonetheless, it works really well. And I don't have that particular mind map book with me to show you an example, but they're in the master class and the, and the mastermind in very, uh, very different ways. So that training is there. Here's a note from Harvinder it says, just to share with you, I'm on a learning curve with Tony Buzan's book about mind maps. It's an amazing tool, as you suggested many times, and uh, that book he's reading is Embracing Change by Tony Buzan, and here's an announcement for you. I was on the Twitter this morning and saw that there's a new Tony Buzan book coming out, which I'm very excited about, and uh, it is a kind of a, a, an interesting synchronicity because I'm starting to focus more on talking about mind maps and the like. Uh, so. It is uh, great that there's this new book, and I, as I tweeted, I, the only daunting thing about this, there's no daunting things about the book, but uh, again, trying to be witty and clever and humorous is <laughs> not knowing which local bookstore to support. Um, but anyway, it's called Mind Map Mastery, and I'm really looking forward to that, because I think uh, mind mapping for language learning is just as powerful as uh, memory palaces, but when you bring them together, woo, the power grows. Um, all right, so if you're hopping on now, hit the thumbs up, let me know where you are in the world if you haven't said hello already. We're going through some more mailbag here. Got tons and tons of email. Um, just looking for the most interesting ones. And you can post any questions that you may have. Silly Raccoon, what a great name, says, teaching myself data science on AWS for getting info as I go along. Well, data science is interesting. I keep waiting for people to explain to me what needs to be memorized in all IT and not getting uh, yet 
a clear path. There's been some offers to collaborate on books and so forth, but the one uh, that we we had gotten started on, the uh, the poor collaborator on that um, had a car accident, and these things happen. But uh, really. Uh, sort of sad about that because he had a very clear idea about what needed to be memorized and then when I have a clear idea what you need to memorize then I can memorize it myself and show you how it can be done. Um, Iheb says that he has a weak memory and has been using memory palaces to get some help. Excellent. Um, we all have a weak memory just as we have weak muscles in our bodies and it's just a matter of training them. And training them consistently over time and giving ourselves the tools that we need to do it. Now, something like this that I talked about today doesn't necessarily translate as the tool for you, but you've got to explore different tools and you'll find something that will push you forward and will keep you moving forward as long as you show up to it for a sufficient amount of time to actually see that it's going to work for you. And you know, you've got to understand what time means and what consistency over time means because there's something really beautiful about this being a hundred days and that is that the real science on habit formation suggests that it's got to be at least 90 days if you want a lifetime habit and then even then like who can guarantee that anything is a lifetime habit right you've got to maintain the habits once that you have had it and so when I picked this up for my second run it worked a lot better than the first time simply because I'd done it once before and uh, that's why this is just a wonderful thing uh, in life is you do stuff you do it consistently you do it over time you show up to it you make sure that it's reasonable what you're actually trying to do in that period of time with some very specific milestones along the way which if you're learning a language the alphabet is a great milestone for 260 days if you do 10 words per day or 10 let's say 10 words per week uh, or whatever and you just let the alphabet be your guide then you, you reduce decision anxiety you just proceed through things and for my second pass I'm just going for words I didn't pick up the last time right and it's just beautiful I don't have to make decisions what am I gonna do today well the next letter in the alphabet this is great uh, as Tony Buzan said the rules will set you free and I created a whole bunch of rules for myself it's called the magnetic memory method works great um, Emerson's here hi Emerson she says, hi Anthony, I'm learning French a little at a time using memory palaces. Awesome. Thank you for saying hello and uh, I've been in enjoying your reports about your progress and uh, thinking about these areas and locations that you've mentioned and it all sounds wonderful and I really enjoy that correspondence with you. So thanks for saying hello and uh, enjoy. Enjoy the process. It's so much fun. Um, another email here from Joe. I saw your video, I'm going to give a TED talk next month on why people should memorize poetry. And I'm collecting various bits of information. Awesome. Well, why should people memorize poetry? I look forward to this TEDx talk. And the reasons I think are, are very, very clear. Because if you can memorize a poem, you can memorize anything, right? That's one reason. The other reason is, is that you can't understand poetry nearly as well as you can when you've memorized it. Because there's a difference between referring to information on a page and r running it through your mind, weighing it through your mind. Oh, it's beautiful. It's, it's a very, very different proposition um, in terms of understanding, in terms of contemplation, in terms of, of observation. Much, much different proposition. So uh, he says, I wanted to know if you got your idea from Francis Yates' book, The Art of Memory. She's a great scholar of the bridge between medieval times and the Renaissance and was the first person I know who used the term memory palaces. Anyway, thanks for the information and greetings from a fellow Brit Lit enthusiast. Okay, well, great. Well, Yates in The Art of Memory is, is, is already not the first person to use that term because she gives some of the history of that term. I find Yates a bit puzzling though. It's a great book and you're right. She is a great bridge between the middle medieval times and the Renaissance. She's a great historian, a great stylist of history actually. Um, but the puzzling thing about the book is that she never used memory palaces or, or indeed, according to her, any of the memory techniques. And that flaw is very evident in how she wrote about them. So even though it's a great book and really informative, it has its limitations, uh, but it has no limitations if you read it 
from the perspective of a nemonist and you're using these techniques, it'll unlock a lot of ideas for you. Not to mention give you endless book recommendations of things that you can and should read from the history of this wonderful tradition. But it is unusual that she never used the techniques herself and she seemed, um, or it, I, it just seems strange to me that she, she would do all that work and not give them a try. I'm not even sure I believe that. But that said, uh, Jonathan Spence, who wrote the Memory Palace of Matteo Ricci, he doesn't, at least not as I recall, he doesn't say whether he used them or not, but you can kind of tell by the way that he described what Ricci's talking about that he didn't use them. All the more so when you actually go and read Ricci, which uh, I'm still working away on my translation of the Shigua Jifa. Um, really interesting. Okay, so thank you for that email and good luck on your TED talk. I am looking forward to that. Uh, so, this must, I wonder if this is the same Barry who was just on there. It's a really long email, so we won't go into that, but thank you, Barry, for this very long report, and I will respond to it as soon as possible in terms of the things that you say and the many good things that you say. Here is a nice Memory Palace drawing from Thomas. Thank you for that, Thomas. Uh, I really appreciate when you guys send in your Memory Palace drawings. Very, very powerful to draw them out. Um, but Thomas says, my struggle is recalling facts and quotes and losing track of thoughts. Uh, and he says, my first Mary Palace was kind of difficult because it was a place that was two stories. <clears throat> well, the first thing is, is that you don't have to have the Memory Palace include two stories of a building. Each story can be its own Memory Palace. And in terms of losing track of thoughts, one wants to consider the difference between everyday memory loss and actual severe problematic memory loss. Because losing track of thoughts is not necessarily a problem. It's a problem if it impedes your ability to be a productive member of society, I suppose. And you'd want to consider it through that lens. But losing track of thoughts is called the ugly sister effect sometimes. And it's certainly related to it. And there's many ways to think about, about that. And gauging the extent to which it is a problem <clears throat> tends to be medically tends to be something more along the lines of, is this interrupting your ability to be a contributing member of society? Is it causing you deep personal psychological distress? Those kinds of things are important. When it comes to um, recalling facts and quotes, the question there is, are you losing track of the quotes and the facts, or did you not properly memorize them in the first place? And so you can think of it from, from that perspective and then do something about it. Because um, you can't lose track of things that you didn't properly memorize. That's not what that's called. Uh, it's called not memorizing it. Uh, so that's pretty important. Um, and when you learn how to pay attention to information properly, then you're already starting to organize it mentally very differently. And when you use a memory palace, then you're very much organizing it differently and then the question just becomes how consistently can you show up to the task of using a memory palace and uh, how good are you going to get at the skill through consistent practice and are you going to push through in order to develop this as a skill it, it, it's ju just that simple and, and it, it's no different than than this being a dojo in karate or kung fu or anything like that. How are you going to come to class? Are you going to practice? Are you going to go through the forms? Are you going to uh, proceed through the belts, so to speak, and the progressive levels of challenge? And are you going to take it, right? <laughs> that's, that's what it comes down to. And there's no excuse for not achieving the top um, if that's what you want. I think there. I think his name is <clears throat> Richard Turner. Um, I'm gonna look him up here. He's a, a magician. He's blind, and yet he can do the most amazing magic tricks. And he's also a, a martial artist, like an extremely skilled martial artist. But he's blind, right? So the limitations that people put on themselves are chosen. They're deliberately decided, and uh, it's just unbelievable. But. Yeah, Richard Turner, that's the right name. And he's just an incredible magician. Incredible, but he can't see. Uh, and he also 
is a martial artist. I mean, so what's, what's, what's another person's excuse? We don't have excuses. We just have the stories that we tell, really. Anybody can do this if they want to. So keep track of your thoughts. Learn how to pay attention to information. Learn how to encode it. Learn how to decode it. And learn how to do it in a way that's consistent. And you will learn anything that you want, basically at the speed that you want, relative to reality and your consistency in showing up. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's a, it's, a, it's a deal you can make with yourself and win. Another email here. Hello, Anthony. I thank you for providing me with what I have dreamed of having, having a powerful memory trick with which I can gain that extra edge over my peers and also ameliorate my life. Oh, wow. Great word, ameliorate. I love when people use nice big words. Let's not lose words. The dumbification, the dumbing down of vocabulary and the new speak is really frightening. I love when people use real words, ameliorate. I have found your techniques immensely helpful, and now that my examinations are going on, especially so for memorizing things without breaking a sweat, geographical details that would have taken days to rote learn, I'm now proceeding to watch more of the masterclass, which I believe will surely add to my knowledge and arm myself. Once again, I wish to express my heartfelt gratitude from KS. Well, thank you, KS. And I like your attitude and your way of describing it. You are arming yourself with some very powerful weapons. And yeah, being able to memorize geographical details like that without spending days on them is super, super powerful and super achievable. And it's not like a martial art, actually, where you have to spend thousands of days and 10,000 hours or whatever whatever uh, convenient little meme people throw around about hours of expertise that you have to do, you can get to some pretty powerful levels very, very quickly if you show up consistently and you can have, you can have the highest belt in the, in the dojo uh, really within weeks if you want it. Uh, okay, this is from Bell. Quick question, Anthony. I don't have many palaces in my past with positive associations and due to a brain injury, I have trouble remembering things. I don't want to waste a good location on a practice attempt. Do I need different location building palace for each subject I learned? Thank you, Bill. Um, okay, so uh, see that Bitcoin is simple has a great post here. Thank you for that on our live. If you're joining us, be sure to post your questions and uh, Hit that thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world if you haven't said hello yet. Uh, well, let's get to Bitcoin is simple. And we'll get back to uh, Bell here in a second. So Bitcoin is simple says, English is not my native language, but I can think in English. You think that studying a third language in English with memory palaces in English instead of my main language would be bad? I don't think there's anything bad that you can do in learning unless you're learning bankrupt, wrong, and evil ideas. There's nothing... There's nothing wrong here, um, but this is exactly what I was talking about here. I'm studying Chinese in German, and German's not my mother tongue. It's far from my Muttersprache, but I use it in order to maintain German, and there's nothing wrong with it, and uh, it's actually really, really important that I'm doing that because it strengthens my German. I, it maintains my German and strengthens it and gives me a deeper association with German and also, it's a great prompt for all my Berlin and Deutschland memory palaces. So it's really, really powerful to use another language uh, to learn a third language. And also, you have that basis. Okay, so let's talk about some memory science here. This is really important to understand. And we're going to have a podcast coming up on bilingualism, the science of it. And also, I did an interview with a scientist talking about language learning and there's something called memory reserve and memory reserve is really really important because as we learn a language we're building up our reserve of that language and so that gives us more of that language with which to build more of that language so you have a foundation then you start to build the house and then you know you build the roof and now that you know how to build the foundation, well, you can go now and build the foundation for another area in that language. So let's say you get really good talking about food, then you can talk about travel, and you build up that, and then you can talk about your profession and build up that. And you make these little mini missions, for example. Well, your reserve from this mini mission is going to serve 
this mini mission. And it's not actually correct to say like this foundation and now you have to rebuild the foundation. You're not really rebuilding the foundation, but you can still think of it as a kind of neighborhood with buildings. And so you've got the reserve, which is the experience of having built this foundation and the experience of having built these walls and the experience of having built this ceiling. And then of course you can add an antenna and you can add a garage and you can add all these elements to that one thing. And all of this is memory reserve. Now, like a house, if, if you learn a language and then you stop uh, learning the language, then you're going to get cracks in the walls, maybe a wall will collapse, but you still have this reserve, right? And the more that you build around, the more reserve, the more you're strengthening this reserve, and the more you're creating more reserve, right? And so when you go to a city, like I remember going to Athens and so forth, and almost all of my associations for the Greek that I memorized while I was there in order to just talk with the locals and you know just be nice and use their language I was using German as my basis not English right so that's really really powerful but when I wanted to or needed to and English came to mind well I had English to work with right and German was the most go-to because it was the language I was speaking the most at the time uh, almost all my English was on my podcast or on YouTube but I would still use English, and I have a much bigger, deeper reserve for English than I do for German, but German was so prevalent then that I drew upon it a lot, and I still draw upon German. And now with Chinese, you can use German for Chinese. There's some even Greek that comes up that can be there, and also the actual locations, the memory palaces from all these different places can be used, and they're part of that reserve. So the more that you use your mind to learn, the more reserve you build up across the board. And then you have specific reserve in terms of the reserve you build up with languages. So I hope that helps answer your question. But ultimately, there's no bad. There's, there can't be bad because you're experimenting, you're exploring, you're using your creative faculties to solve problems. Forgetting is a problem. And what we are doing is learning how to solve that problem of forgetting in our particular context with our brain with our learning hierarchies, with our sensory preferences. And we're using the toolbox and all the tools inside the toolbox of memory and mnemonics. And there are multiple tools inside of there. And discipline is one of those tools. And there's a very specific discipline for memory and a specific discipline for language learning. And then there's the specific discipline of those things together. And you bundle them up and they have great, great power. Uh, used independently and loosey-goosey and wobbly knobbly then you know not so good but I can't see any uh, anything going wrong with uh, with what you're talking about it's a great question and great name too by the way Bitcoin is simple I like, I like that um, thanks for that if you're just joining us and you got a question be sure to post it we're doing mailbag and uh, answering your questions on this morning's live session uh, so yeah back to Bell Basically, her question is one that I get all the time. The idea of wasting a good location on a practice attempt. Not possible. It's just not possible. You do not waste a memory palace. You cannot waste a memory palace. The only way you could, actually you can. You waste it by not using it. That's the waste, right? But by going through the practice, you're not wasting it. It's not a piece of canvas that you wish you had rather saved for when you're a better painter. It's, does, it's not like that at all. This is your mind. This is a mental canvas that you can use again and again and again. And in fact, there's an actual re compelling reason to use memory palaces when you're not ready. And that is because the reuse of memory palaces is its own skill, which you will develop. But you can't go around in fear. That's not the way to do this. This is a craft, it's an art, it's a science, and it's one of the perfect sciences because you can't make mistakes. You really can't. The worst thing that can happen is ghosting or the ugly sister effect. That is not a bad thing. It's a very good thing. It means that you're good at this technique already. So you can't make a mistake. And as I talked about on the full podcast episode about the ugly sister technique and ghosting, these are assets. These are assets. If you ever have this problem of ghosting or, uh, or of uh, the ugly sister effect, it's not a problem. It's, it's showing that this works. 
and it works very well for you, and so it's a blessing. So do not go in fear. Fear, as Frank Herbert said in Dune, is the mind killer. Fear is the mind killer. Get it out of your life. Relax. Satanama. It's just go, go in there with reckless childhood abandon. Make a mess. Make things memorable. It won't be a waste. Then just rewrite it. Clean it up. Wax on, wax off, all that stuff. And then explore what that's like for you. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So thanks, Belle, for that. That was great. Uh, that uh, is, is a very common question, though. I wish that I had a louder megaphone uh, to, to, to yell the answer because no one should have a fear of misusing a memory palace. It's just not possible. It's not possible. Uh, and even if it were possible, we would find a way to turn it into an asset because everything that you do to exercise your memory is automatically de facto an asset. It's very, very powerful. All right. So now we have... Uh, um, Takashi says, I need to speed things up a little. Well, it's very easy. Practice. I like to practice, and the more I practice, the better I get. And the more, I, the better I get, the more I feel compelled to practice. So it's a perfect circle. You just got to find your way into the circle. Uh, Bitcoin is simple says, thanks a lot for the detailed answer. I'm studying Mandarin using English because it's easier to find resources in English and started following your tips recently. Awesome. Thanks for letting me know. And uh, what is your mother tongue, by the way? That would be interesting to know. Um, if you're joining us live and you have questions or you haven't said hello yet, let me know where you are in the world. Uh, email here. I'll keep this name anonymous. Is there any way I can get rid of social anxiety? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, first of all, I always teach memory in the context of meditation, relaxation, you know, relax your jaw even before you speak so that you don't mistake tension in the jaw for a mental problem. But you can uh, easily, easily get rid of social anxiety by just practicing things like remembering names in private and then you don't have to go and actually use the skill publicly when you're in a in a social setting, but you can just privately practice these techniques and test silently by, you know, memorizing a name on a name tag and then as the person's back is to you, recalling what that name is and then when they naturally turn around, you can see what their name is and now you have con confirmation that these techniques work for you and you get a little victory for that, gives you some confidence boost and then you can take the next step when you're ready, which is just to say, Hey, Janet, thanks uh, for being such a great uh, servant today, or whatever. I mean, you've got to come up with your own scenario, but of course it can help relieve social anxiety. Uh, I have a course in the masterclass called Speak From Memory, which was originally called Language Learning for Introverts. And I mean, I'm an introvert myself, and or at least I have that tendency. And, uh, and as I mentioned before, I'm not really big on chit chat and so forth, but not being big on chit chat and social anxiety are two different things. Although I, ha I have had social anxiety and so forth and just general, generally practicing relaxation, for forget or leave the memory stuff aside for a moment. Generally practicing relaxation is a huge benefit in terms of all that stuff because people just hold so much tension in their bodies and that leads to tension in the mind. And if you can relax the body, you will tend to relax the mind. And uh, keep in mind that your mind is physical. It's produced by the brain. So whatever state your body is in and your brain is in, uh, your, your, your mind is sure to follow because your mind is actually produced by that body. It's produced by the chemistry. So yeah, you can get a great social anxiety advantage. And I, I should just also say that it's, it's given me extreme confidence that I never had and I probably told you before or maybe not you personally but I've certainly talked about it before when I was in my fourth year of university when they told me I had bipolar disorder and locked me up in a hospital for three months and gave me shattering chemicals that fractured my psyche beyond belief and I was shaking like this the whole time <laughs> and I had to go and give a, a, a speech in class some of my professors were very kind and they saw me giving this letter saying you know please I don't, I need an alternative assignment, please. And another person was like, no, 
if this is true, you have to go to the Behavioral Sciences Building and get a letter from them that explains your condition so that I just, you know, like he was just a real jerk about it all. Um, and him actually behaving that way gave me even more anxiety about all this stuff. And I still have a kind of little seed of anger around that because no person in a position of power like that should rub it in, you know? You should take a student at their word. And I, I didn't ask him for a free grade or a free pass. I asked him for an alternative assignment. Like, give me another 20 pages. I don't care. I just don't want to have to speak when lithium is making me shake like this, right? So it was like nervousness on top of nervousness on top of anxiety. And uh, in any case, it all worked out in the end, but it bruised me for longer and it took the eventual progress to becoming a public speaker longer than it needed to. And I, keep in mind, I had already been a public speaker before that. I used to do comedy and stuff. And I was an actor in a lot of plays. I played Eugene in Greece and sang in front of people. I was, I was a bass player. I still am a bass player. And I played trombone and stuff. I did had, had no problem with performing. But I had a blip in my life of extreme anxiety that was exacerbated by someone who should know better and shouldn't use their position of power like that. In any case, speech over, but I, I've been there. And really what was so excellent about that is I got into things like hypnosis and meditation and was able to debug it. And it was by understanding that the actual mind is produced by the body. Uh, it didn't happen overnight, but it did happen in a great way. And, and memory techniques were a part of it because I had confidence from understanding that actually, wait, wait a minute, I can actually memorize anything and I don't, that is the basis upon which I can go and even though I'm still shaking, and I shook for years from lithium, I can just have the confidence that I won't forget what I'm saying even if I'm saying it in a shaky way. So that was huge, huge for me. Ah, PPC mode, Brent Dunn's here. Hi, thanks for uh, being here and saying hello. Very interesting, you say. Um, I actually have SAD and have had TMJ clicking in my jaw for the longest time. Confidence is really the only things that help ease it. Well, thank you for posting that, Brent, and uh, interesting to know. I mean, I've watched lots of your videos and I never would have guessed, but um, yeah, uh, well, I, I've i wondered if I have SAD as well, uh, it, assuming you're talking about seasonal affective disorder. I mean, Canadians possibly have it <laughs> to, by, by default, but um, I, I do notice that, I mean, I just have had an uh, extreme, periods where the darkness just is like it's in your soul and and then you'll get a sunny day and just be jumping out of bed like for no reason and woohoo conquer the world for some reason people call that bipolar disorder but <laughs> in any case i don't mean to make light of it but one has to at some at some point because there's real suffering involved and and for me the the, the real cure has been just bodily relaxation and and, and developing confidence, finding ways to be confident. So thanks for sharing that. Um, appreciate it. Uh, Don says, I want to improve my memory under pressure. Thank you. Well, that's just about what we've been talking about. And, and the way that you do it is, you, at some point you just pr practice improving your memory when you're not under pressure. And then you escalate the degrees of pressure. So a hierarchy of escalation might look like something like, let's just use the example of language learning. Let's say that you are gonna to go to a language learning event where everybody there but you is maybe at A2 level and you're only at A1, and you're feeling nervous about that. So what can you do? Well, you can practice by yourself with your learning materials in the shower. So from memory, You've got some phrases that you want to say that are now a little bit level higher than you're able to speak, and you just start r riffing them in the shower. That's level zero, no stress at all. I mean, if you are scared of the echo in the shower, then you can work on that, but really there should be pretty zero anxiety there. Then the next thing would be to do it in front of a pet, a turtle, a dog, a cat, whatever. And I'm not joking like it's literally escalating it so that there's another thing in the room or you can do it into a recording right and the next escalation a friend that you know won't mock you who will be supportive 
and you just say, look, I just want to run through these phrases. I know you're not even learning this language, but it's important to me to do it in front of another human being. Bear with me. If you don't have a friend like that, find one and uh, raise the level of escalation there. Raise the pressure. You will naturally be pressured. I'm pressured all the time in front of my wife because she watches my tones like a hawk in Chinese, right? But just use it. And if I want to escalate the pressure, I go down to the coffee shop below and, you know, ask for the for the lao ban. And, uh, you know, they'll look at me and then I'll say it again until I get the tone correct. <laughs> and it's just, a, it's a higher level of pressure. Then you could do it at a family dinner. Tell your family, hey, this is what I'm doing. Um, don't mock me. I'm just trying. I need to speak in front of other people. And then do it with a speaking partner on Skype, like a, a teacher who has some authority or another speaking partner. Then maybe if you have a YouTube channel, do it on your YouTube channel and just tell your audience, hey, you know, uh, or, or even nobody, if you don't have an audience, but just put it out there. Put it on a blog, maybe in words, so it's not a video. And just share with people and get it out there. Get it out there, just get it out. Escalate the pressure. Then finally, go to the event and maybe just do it internally for the first half hour. Or go to the bathroom in the event and do it in the bathroom where no one's there Turn on the hand drying machine and uh, say it so nobody hears you and, you know, get it into your mouth. Relax your jaw. Make sure you're really relaxed. I mean, I've got a, another video coming that's got all these little mouth exercises. It kind of looks gross, but uh, how I relax my mouth is tremendously useful for just being relaxed. And then just go out and speak, you know, don't worry about it too much. Um, one helpful tip to keep in mind is the point about social in inattention no one is paying that much attention to you. No one really cares. So don't get all involved in what other people are perceiving about you. 99% of what you do, they will forget. Guaranteed, right? A great book for this is called You, you Are Not So Smart. I've never really liked that title because I don't like saying to people, you are not so smart, but uh, <laughs> that's what it's called. And it's a very, very good book. And it talks about this problem of how we think people are paying way more attention to us than they really are. So, you know, just like a, a typical example of that is I got a pimple today, right? And I could have said, well, I'm not gonna go on Facebook, or sorry, YouTube. Heaven forbid we would be on Facebook right now. But, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but um, I could have said to myself, yeah, everybody's gonna notice this hideous pimple that I have. Uh, I probably have three of them but no one's gonna notice. Probably no one even noticed until that I pointed it out. And maybe it's not even noticeable on these tiny little screens anyway. So if you were to keep in mind what other people are thinking about you too much, man, you're just, you're, you're psyching yourself out of life's pleasures. Wow, super chat from Brent. Thanks for that. That's uh, amazing, awesome. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I don't even know what to say. Thank you, very kind of you. Um, and thank you everyone for the great questions and the discussion. It's, uh, it's, it's really, really important to just find your, your way in. These tips may not be the best for you, and I'm aware that turning on the dryer in the bathroom so you can practice speaking a language is like pretty idiosyncratic and weird, but why not try it? If you're that uh, pressured why not try it? Because you'll be in the event itself and you'll, you'll have already seen the people. Your brain chemicals will have accustomized and acclimatized to the levels of light, the, the sound levels and so forth. And keep in mind that this is real. Like all this, all this stuff in the environment is really actually impacting you and it's causing things to happen to you. And the more that you're aware of this, the more you can control it, you can combat it. Awareness is everything. Um, it really is. And the more you're aware of yourself as just this biological unit that is, you're like a ship being tossed around on the seas of chemicals. And the more that you become the captain of that ship who understands the waves, then the more you steer yourself out of the storms and find calm seas, and then just do the work of captaining the ship wherever it is you want to go. It's pretty, it's pretty incredibly simple. It's just a, how do you become that captain? Well, this is the discussion that we're having now. Um, Brent says, the build up right before speaking is the worst part. Once I get past the shaky heart pounding intro, things are okay. 
but it's always the first 30 to 60 seconds that is the worst part. Yeah, I know, uh, I know how, that, how that feels, and what I do to combat that, uh, and maybe it'll be useful for you, is I do a particular kind of breathing before that I talk at an event, for example, um, because I know that that's coming. And this could be useful in certain contexts if you set the stage for it in just any event where you need to talk to people. Um, but what I do is I, I breathe in for a count and then I hold for a count and then I breathe out for a count. So the numbers are kind of arbitrary, but there's different patterns and different people have recommended different numbers. But I tend to breathe in for a count of four. So inhaling and counting to four, then holding while counting to eight, and then exhaling while counting to five. That's one pattern. Uh, another pattern is inhaling for four and holding to a count of 16, and then exhaling for eight. A variation on this is to imagine that you're inhaling through the left nostril, then hold for a particular number, and then exhale, imagining that you're doing it through the other nostril, and then reverse the pattern by inhaling through this nostril, the, like the right nostril, and holding for a count, and then exhaling for another count. And why that's so powerful is, uh, well, I don't know, it's, just, it's like a pattern interruption, first and foremost. It's interrupting you from the thought of whatever's coming. And then you're oxygenating the brain. There's all kinds of things you can read about this, like Wim Hof stuff is interesting. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know all the ins and outs of the science of oxygenation. I just know from my own experience that it's just been a great way of acknowledging that that 30 to 60 seconds of pure raw nervousness is coming and then mitigating it, interrupting it, putting a wedge between myself and it. And it kind of, it creates a mental state where you're just much more immersed in, in the physical world and not so much immersed in the mental world. And so that's been really helpful for me. And then of course, just diving in and doing it consistently makes it different as well. But it's an interesting thing because it never goes away. Uh, this, this thing of the initial seconds, whether it's going to a new meeting and introducing yourself and so forth, but this technique always helps to varying degrees depending on what it is. Uh, and again, I think too, the social inattention point is really important. Realizing that most people are not going to really pay that close attention is helpful. I find it very helpful. And I also find it helpful in the regard that I'm going to use memory techniques and I'm going to memorize their names. And so it, it, it's like a confidence thing, but it's also a bit of a, uh, I don't want to use this word, but it is this word. It's a bit of a social su superiority thing because I'm going to be the guy who can say, well, James or Janet or whoever, it was really great meeting you, right? And then I'm going to tell them, you know, what their, their son, you know, that, that story you told me about Oliver, your son, was really interesting. I hope to meet him one day and so forth. That's kind of an interesting feeling that helps to, helps to make this less of an issue, uh, even though it remains an issue. Knowing that that's what you're going to do and knowing that you're going to do it. And even having an out because the odd time you'll make a mistake with a name and so forth and just being prepared and saying, you know, I, I, I practice my memory and I'm not sure why I made that mistake. We're really sorry, but you know, here's what's going on in my mind and so forth. And uh, it, it almost never ever happens. But uh, if it does, just being prepared to have radical honesty around it and just say, oh, well, I, I try to memorize names and I apologize that I got yours wrong. Um, you're fearless. You're fearless because you're already prepared for what it is that you're going to do if something goes wrong. Um, and uh, it's the samurai principle, you know? Be, I don't know if you ever saw Ghost Dog, really great movie, but uh, there's a quote in there which is, you know, the way of the samurai, uh, this is not the exact quote. Uh, actually, as I recall, it's said different ways in the movie. But the whole point is, is that the um, the, 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 one of the ways of the samurai is to be prepared to execute one last move, even with your head cut off. And I've always loved that, and it, I think it's a great, a great uh, image of what memory is really all about. And, and you can learn a lot about that from the memory champions as well, because 
it's not a 100% game. It's points based, right? And you can actually win a lot of the memory competitions even if you've made some very, very critical errors. But so long as you can execute the right moves when your head's cut off, you can still win. Um, so it's a great demonstration of skill. And part of the demonstration of skill is your tact, your social tact, um, and how you manage what you're going to do when you make a faux pas. So it's not even just about memory mistakes you might make, but just general mistakes of conduct that we all make and understanding or having a bit of thought about what you're going to do when you flub and be, just being openly cognizant of it and, and having your own little set of ways of dealing with it and then even being flexible to that. And you'll find almost all the time that you wind up apologizing for things that no one even noticed. So <laughs> it's really wild. But they do notice actually that you're the kind of person who's conscientious about the potential that that might have been misread, which is itself its own power. Uh, I've never had it go wrong, really. Except for that people say, oh, you're a Canadian. And that's why you apologize so much. <laughs> I don't know if I'm Canadian anymore. But the roots of our heritage certainly go deep. Anyway, that was a great question uh, from uh, both Don and from Brent about pressure and, and things going on. And it's uh, really amazing what you can do for yourself by becoming the captain of your own ship and understanding that weather changes. Um, and weather changes often rapidly without warning and uh, will continue to do so forever, as long as you're here on the planet. Rohit says, I consistently experience brain fog. Well, yeah, that's a, an issue. A lot of brain fog comes from diet, and I'm not going to wax messianic about what people should or shouldn't eat, but there are some very well understood foods that tend to create brain fog, wheat being one of them, milk. Uh, I, I eat neither, uh, although I do have the odd dairy because I'm an ice cream fanatic. Actually, oh no, not an ice cream fanatic, but uh, but uh, those of you who know Chinese, um, <laughs> chocolatey bing chiling. <laughs> I love it. I love chocolate ice cream, and uh, I love that that word for cho for chocolate ice cream in uh, in uh, in Chinese. But the thing is, is that it always backfires. Uh, it, it's not good. In fact, that's the source of my pimples because we were on vacation and I ate some chocolate ice cream. Um, but I, I think that the brain fog really almost consistently comes down to dietary choices. And it may be things to do with the thyroid and so forth. Memory training can, can certainly help. And, but it helped me during periods of depression and dealing with the brain fog of medication. And medication can be another source of, of brain fog. But when I had brain fog from, and it's not clear that it was only from medication because I was a beer drinker at the time too. I used to joke that Guinness was my meat and potatoes in university, which is not funny. And it's not a joke I'm making now, but it is what I used to do. And I, I had a, a certain sinister pride in having been able to drink so much and eat so little and still be a top student. Not cool, and it's not the right use of memory techniques, but memory techniques used to help a lot, <laughs> I must say. And I laugh about it, even though it's not funny. Um, but it's true, the memory techniques can help even if you are, if you are, are, are drinking and smoking and all that sort of stuff. But nothing has helped cut through brain fog for me than ditching the medicine. And I was only able to ditch the medicine because I took care of my diet. And I went through almost a year of taking care of my diet before I decided to stop taking medicine for depression and bipolar disorder. And I'm very glad that I did it in that order because I don't think it would have worked otherwise. I think it would have backfired very badly. But now I'm two years clean from medicine. Um, and I'm clean from booze also. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not preaching against alcohol as such, although when one says, when I say at various functions that I'm at that I don't drink, there's the odd phenomenon of people then explaining why they do drink as if I was asking them to apologize for it because they know or they seem to feel that there's something inherently wrong about their, their drinking habits. And um, I don't mean to make that judgment on them, but it's as if the as if the unconscious mind needs to acknowledge and recognize that there is a poisonous effect to it 
uh, and I certainly knew it all along, even when I was joking about Guinness being my bread and, and butter. I, I, as much as I liked at the time drinking an alcohol, I didn't like it at the same time uh, for many reasons. Uh, and one is just the intense knowledge that it is causing damage, and it was making me very fat in addition to lithium and, and so forth. So, yes, the memory techniques helped cut through the brain fog from that, but nothing even remotely close to the mental clarity and ability to concentrate for long periods of time that have helped me since dealing with my diet and removing alcohol from my life. And there's many, many other benefits as well. Like, incredible benefits of feeling better, looking better, how that you are able to engage socially, and how you, those faux pas that we were just talking about, the social mistakes and forgetting names that you make, yeah, if your brain is filled with unhealthy chemicals and you're drinking and you have three day, maybe longer repercussions from drinking and from bad food, because there's a 72 hour cycle at least, yeah, you're gonna make more mistakes socially and you're not gonna feel nearly as good as yourself as you do when you're like ripped and you're full of energy and vitality from a good diet and from regular exercise and all that stuff. Wow, like you can just leave the memory techniques aside, you're gonna feel way better. And then you have memory techniques on top of that, you're like a sword cutting through the junk of the world and the junk of the potential previous mind that you had and you'll never forget that good feeling. You might eat some chocolate ice cream from time to time. There's an interview with Tony Robbins actually on the four hour, uh, uh, four hour work week podcast where Tony Robbins talks about eating uh, ice cream as a deviation from his normal stringent diet with his wife and his wife explained you know that she's just living life you know enjoying life so <laughs> you don't want to be like so rigid but the power of habits over time are incredible what they do for your health and uh, amazing wonderful Jacob asks can frontal lobe trauma cause brain fog I don't know about and I don't really know anything about frontal lobe trauma, but I'd imagine that any kind of physical impact to the brain is going to cause problems. I mean, I've had a concussion. I've been hit by a car twice in my life, and I was also shocked very badly by electricity once. Actually, I've been hit by a car three times. In any case, <laughs> drinking. <laughs> uh, and at various car accidents also. I was hit by a guy who looked exactly like Tom Cruise in Italy one time, rear-ended me. Long story. Great memory palaces came out of it, though. Anyway, um, I, I, I've noticed some, some effects of those impacts to the brain for days afterwards, so I think it stands to reason that maybe you could have some effects. Uh, Jacob says, best food to combat brain fog as a vegan. I'm not a vegan, so I can't really advise on this. Sorry to be unhelpful, but um, I can't uh, speak to the vegan thing. But blueberries? are uh, well known to be good for memory. Walnuts, I mean, I don't, it's, this is the problem. I don't know enough about veganism to know whether blueberries and walnuts fall, fall under veganism. So forgive my ignorance of the topic. Um, but green tea, maybe? Uh, and that's, that's about it that's coming to mind. But in general, there's, there's so many conflicting reports about what vegans should or shouldn't do and so forth um, that you really need to talk to talk to an expert in that in that in that area and even then expertise is quite flawed because it's diet isn't n equals one proposition no matter what you do so I don't think the right question is what is good for vegans for memory but what is good for you as a vegan right and so then what you do is things like a food grid and a, a uh, elimination diet and a three-day rotation diet to really test what's going to make you feel better and uh, that I think you'll find very very useful that is a, another question of discipline how do you get yourself to do that and then of course something like this can be very useful for making sure that you see what it is that your goal is every day you have a place to track everything and you show up to it you implement and you have reasonable small goals that actually can be completed. And a 100-day elimination diet followed by a 100-day rotation diet 
is well done, well doable, easily done, and I've done it. And I didn't use a Freedom Journal for it, but I did journal the whole thing. I had to because I had hired health coaches to help make sure that I actually got this done and did done properly with the best possible scientific external understanding free from my subjective judgment of it, or at least not overly um, influenced by my subjective judgment of what was going on for me. But uh, absolutely 100% you can do this and I think that that's the real question to ask. Not what are the best foods for memory for a vegan, but what are the best foods for you as a vegan for memory. So I hope that that helps you and I would highly recommend that you do that. Um, and you might have some interesting exploration uh, discoveries that benefit all areas of your life, not just memory. Uh, Jacob, thanks for these questions. Uh, you ask, do you recommend meditation alongside using a mind palace? That was the subject of the previous video on the channel, so dive into that. Not only do I recommend it, but I give you some tips and strategies on how to do it properly or properly, properly on an N equals one basis so that you're exploring it in the most empowered way. Um, and I talk about the Kirtan Kriya, which is the Sata Nama meditation that I've been finding so wonderful, so freeing. And it's neat. The more that you meditate, the better your memory gets and the better your meditations get. Like the, it's, it's astonishing to me how incredibly deep the ocean of relaxation goes um, and well-being and dealing with stress and, and stuff. And it's not like life's problems go away or memory problems go away. Well, memory problems do go away, but it's just, it's very, very different. Um, and it's good for creativity as well. Um, it's not only good for creativity, but it just makes you more creative because you're calm and you're relaxed and you're not coming at the world with reaction, but rather with a sense of acceptance, which is exactly what you need to memorize information. You're, it's, it's, it's back to the martial arts metaphor. And I wouldn't say it's like karate and I wouldn't say it's like kung fu actually, even though I used those words before. It's more judo, more sistema, in the sense that you're receiving the energy of information and then you're directing it where you want it to go. Uh, so in sistema, for example, my teacher, he used the metaphor of folding paper. The idea was to fold paper in such a way that it goes where you want it to go and it stays there until they, you know, it, the, 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 the conflict is gone. And this is a very, very powerful metaphor for memory techniques as well. You want to receive that energy of new information, you want to fold it up like a little piece of paper, like a magnet, and stick it so that it stays where you want it to, and then you revisit it a sufficient number of times to recall it. And meditation has everything to do with your skill of being receptive to energy as it comes in, and then encouraging that energy to do what it is that you want it to do as opposed to it just flipping past schools of fish. And uh, yeah, I recommend it. It's, it's a huge part of what I do and what I teach and, and part of why that it helps so many people who take the Magnetic Memory Method trainings because they're relaxed when they use it. And then when you relax during the memorization process, you're relaxed during recall. And it, it's, it's got a balance. And that's a huge part of the key to all of this is relax, be calm, carry on, all that stuff. Anyway, I wanted to mention a book, speaking of fishing and all these, all these ocean metaphors that I like to use. Maybe I was in my deep days of my own studies of meditation and so forth, influenced by um, David Lynch who wrote Catching the Big Fish. And it's a book about meditation and creativity. If you haven't read Catching the Big Fish by David Lynch, like Tootswit, right now, go get that book, read it, gobble it down. I have my beef with meditation and David Lynch and cults and stuff, but that does not denude or deny the value of that book. It's incredible. There's a bit of sadness that I have about what he's done, uh, which he may or may not be doing anymore, but uh, uh, it is really, really important. Uh, Jacob asks, does drawing improve memory and creativity? Well, I think again, it's, it, it, the question is, will it improve creativity for you and memory for you? I think it's impossible for drawing not to improve creativity because drawing is creativity. Drawing is an act of creation. So 
I like to draw a lot. And this simple act here increased my creativity because I did it. It was an act of creation. Anytime that you engage in an act of creation, you're going to improve your creativity. Now, this may not seem to you the most creative thing in the world, but it uh, doesn't matter. It's me. It's my creativity, and I'm having fun, and I'm exploring. Likewise, this. So my creativity got better by drawing this and coloring it. And uh, yeah, I would say definitely. Now, did it improve my memory? Well, that's hard, a hard case to make. But there's another kind of drawing that, uh, for example, looks like this, which is a mind map. And uh, I'll just show you that briefly. That's a mind map I'm working on for a book. And uh, there's another one that I just did a video on, which you can see in detail. The previous video on this channel, I actually took individual shots of each part of the mind map. And this is a form of drawing. And this is how you use drawing to improve your memory. So I can mentally think in my mind of this part of the mind map without looking at the mind map and tell you what this all means. And I can just look at a glance and go, oh yes, in, uh, in the diary of a bookseller, he was, one of the themes that really struck me is how he talks about getting older. And there's many ways that the theme of age comes up in the book. There's the, the uh, his name's Sean Bithel, uh, the narrator, author, Sean Bithel. He, um, he talks about himself getting older, his back problems that emerged from carrying around so many books. And he talks about a numerous cast of characters in the neighborhood and how they're getting older. And I put this little stick here to remind me of how one of the characters brings in walking sticks in exchange for credits on books. Then I have the glasses to remind me that uh, he has a scene where he's like reading in the tub or something and someone says, you know, you should, should um, replace the light bulbs, but he ends up getting new glasses anyway. Um, this connects also actually incidentally to another point on the mind map, which I just comes to mind. This is why mind maps are so awesome, is that there's a, a scene about uh, Orwell's point about windows, how important windows are to bookshops. And uh, that's connected to the glass of, of of eyeglasses, which is also connected to the glass of, of Kindle. Well, that's not really glass, but the shotgun shooting things. I mean, like you just, my creativity is through the roof. The creative connections that I'm making that, it, that are there because I drew on this. And then, you know, there's the, the glass of a beer mug and so forth. And whiskey comes up a, a fair shake in the, in the book and so on. So does it improve memory and creativity? 100%. Look at this right here in multiple ways in this big ass book. And I highly recommend you go and get a big book and start doing this stuff because it's not only good for memory and uh, creativity, but it's just fun. It's good for fun. It's good for life. It's good for joy. It's good for all kinds of things. So yeah, and quite frankly, I don't see a real fundamental difference between drawing and handwriting. So handwriting is super powerful. It's just a, it's just a glorified form of of drawing that has more specific, localized, territorialized meaning that uh, drawings, well, actually drawings can have more specific territorialized meaning as well, depending on what it is. In any case, um, I hope that answers your question, and I really appreciate it, Jacob. Uh, really great, compelling, interesting questions, the kind of, that we like, uh, and keep them coming. Uh, Jack says, how many memory palaces do you have? How many Lokis do you use per room? The question is unanswerable. I now have so many memory palaces, I couldn't even possibly begin to list them. It's, the last count was 250-ish. And the reason why I don't even list them anymore is because they are there for spontaneous use, they're there for strategic use, and so forth. But just to give you an example, I was memorizing some words here with um, uh, Chinese, the letter H, and I chose Henry's studio, right? So Henry, I haven't seen Henry for years. He's a German-Russian translator from New York that I met in Berlin, and he had taken me a few times to his apartment, but only one time did I ever see his painting studio. He's a great painter. He did a portrait of me, actually, <laughs> which looks really weird, but I love it. Um, and uh, so that's just like one of many, many Mary Palaces. I have an infinity of Mary Palaces in some sense, because the more that you revisit Mary Palaces, they're, they're, they're different versions of themselves and so on. So I don't really have a pat answer to that. I'm not even, I'm not even sure that it's a, 
a particularly interesting one, but uh, have as many memory palaces as you possibly can and then have multiple versions of them. And in terms of how many Lokis, I don't use the word Loki because it's just not useful. It's not nearly as useful as magnetic station. So how many magnetic stations I have are all about the practical goal of the memory palace. So when you know your uh, number of words that you want to memorize to make sure you're stretching yourself but not frustrating yourself, then that's the number. Um, and you, there's just a lot to learn. So if you haven't taken my free course, uh, please do. And you may want to dive in more into the masterclass for more of the the conditional logic that you would apply to memory palace creation and use. But it's one of those things where I'm quite, uh, I just, it's just it's not the right question. The, the question of how many memory palaces one has and how many stations you have inside the memory palaces. The right question is, what is my goal? What are the milestones along the way to accomplishing the goal? And what am I gonna do to achieve that? And then the memory palaces will create themselves. And I have worksheets to that effect and so forth. So um, there's a link. Uh, oh, the link isn't there yet below, but it's magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash YT. I'm without my handy low-tech index cards at the moment, but magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash YT. Harvinder's here. Hello, Harvinder. We uh, answered a question of yours earlier, and uh, while well, I hope that uh, you're able to, to go through the replay, um, yeah, uh, Basically, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, it's, it, it's, it's really, really simple. Yes, that is a great book to read by Tony Buzan. Um, and I appreciate you mentioning it, because it is a great book. Um, and uh, you're right, it is an amazing tool. Uh, Jack says, thanks. For th thank you, Jack. Great question. Um, Brent says, is it better to use memory palaces from places you haven't been to in a while, or something you see frequently even if it's often changing, such as chairs moving, etc. Great questions, Brent, thanks. Um, so the better, worse question is hard to answer because it has a lot to do with where you are in the journey with using memory palaces. And so, the, I mean, the, 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 poten the potentially most useful answer for all people is that there is something called the recency effect and the primacy effect. And those tell us that what we have seen first in a sequence of information and what we've seen most recently in a sequence of information are going to be the most prominent in our minds. And so the most recent place will tend to serve much better as a memory palace than perhaps the most distant place. However, relative to your skill with spatial memory, then that's, that proposition is going to change. And so something like my elementary school works just as well as this apartment. It just does. And I haven't been to my elementary school for 35 years at least, right? Um, but the, the, again, this is conditional because I've used that memory palace in very specific ways. I've drawn it out on paper. I've thought about it. I've thought about each individual classroom that I remember. The designers of that particular elementary school had the wherewithal to actually use clockwise structure to have seven classrooms for the seven grades of that school. And they had this sort of external entrance for preschool that doesn't really disrupt with this clockwork, the clockwise structure. So it lends itself in many ways to helping the memory palace creation process that my high school, the first high school I went to, I went to. Four, I think altogether um, uh, and then of course there's just multiple high schools in the community where I went to that I also used that I didn't attend as a student but uh, the next high school it doesn't lend itself in that same way even though it, you could still impose a clock like structure or what I call seashelling onto it it doesn't work as cleanly as all that but you want to look for in the buildings that you choose the opportunity to seashell in and out of rooms in a way that assists or reduces cognitive load and makes it as, um, as brain dead easy to navigate as possible. And the reason for that is that the more time you spend thinking about the journey, the less time and mental energy you have on the actual magnetic imagery that you place there. So that's the real answer to the question is, it's not so much the primacy or the recency 
of your personal contact with the memory palace, it's the suitability of the location for the use to which you're putting it. And not all memory palaces are created equal. They're not even created for the purpose of doing this, so that's itself a kind of interesting challenge. But with a bit of strategical thinking and experience with this, you just find the right ones. And there's an odd synchronicity that happens over time where they'll just come to mind. The, the right one will come to mind. It's very rare that the wrong one will come to mind, but when it does, you just switch the kaleidoscope and find another one and go from there. You can transport what you've done from one memory palace into another. It's just kind of like, you know, moving stuff around. Now, in terms of move, furniture that may have moved and so forth, uh, I've never had an issue with this. Um, and I don't, I suppose it's one of those things where if it's an issue, it's probably just a sign of how good your memory is. So work with that as a strength rather than making it a barrier. A lot of people turn their assets into, into obstructions when you could just focus on them being uh, a, 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 an asset instead of a barrier. Um, we're going to be wrapping up here pretty quick, but uh, I really appreciate all these, these questions. And uh, we're going to do this again, of course. Um, but very quickly, a last few questions. Jacob says, can you use memory palaces for playing an instrument? Yes, of course. I've talked about that a lot in the master class in the FAQ section in particular. A an instrument is itself a memory palace in many cases. Um, maybe not all, but in many. And I talk about that a lot uh, in the master class. So go to the FAQ section when you're in. Harvinder says, can we use memory palace plus mind maps simultaneously? like using branches of mind maps to link up with locations or mind maps separately? Uh, or is mind map a different tool to use separately? Absolutely, you can. There's a podcast episode on magneticmerrymethod.com that is called uh, Mind Mapping with Phil, Phil Chambers. Um, mind Mapping and Memory Palaces Together with Phil Chambers. We talk about this in, in very, very great detail. I talk about this in the FAQ section, Harvinder. There are videos very much about linking these things together. Keep in mind that the, the mind map is a memory palace de facto. So just as I was going through here, I was talking about a part here, and then I started to remember, oh yeah, also George Orwell talked about windows and their importance in, in bookshelves, and that's over here. So my mind actually went to the space where that is on the memory palace. So this is a memory palace in and of itself. Now, all I need to do is I have this clock-like structure. I know how many arms are on this clock or how many lines are, right? And I just take that number, create a memory palace, and then encode all this stuff into a memory palace. There's a video all about this memory palace. It's the previous video on this channel. I'll put it in the links below uh, if you're watching the replay, and then you can go watch it. I'm very, very excited about the implications of mind mapping for memory palaces, but I think the first thing to understand is Mem mind palaces are already de facto memory palaces. You just might not be thinking about it that way. But spatial memory is everything and everywhere, including your own brain. And let's never forget this. Your brain is a series of locations. Don't want to sound too like the matrix here, but that's really what's going on. Everything is in a location. The chemicals are there. When the information comes into your brain, it's split apart. It's dispersed all over the place, chemically encoded. Bread goes into a toaster, it's chemically changed into toast. Information, when it comes into your mind, is chemically changed, and it changes the chemical nature of your brain. How do you direct some of that? How do you make the storage of information in your brain under your command so you get it back? All the things that we talk about at magneticmemorymethod.com, because you can influence the chemical nature of your brain, which is a series of locations. And all information is located somewhere in the world. It has a location, just like Neo had a location when he was in the Matrix, and then he was freed by Morpheus and company by them knowing that location and his willingness to participate in the act of freedom. So too can I help you locate all information that you would want and free it into your long-term memory if you want to participate. So all you got to do is get trained up. Come to magneticmemorymethod.com and there are worksheets, there are videos, there's every possible resource that you need, including interviews with the best of the best on magneticmemorymethod.com. Harvinder says, thank you, Master Anthony. Well, thank you, Master Harvinder. You are a great student of the Magnetic Memory Method. I always appreciate 
no participation. And I appreciate, too, you showing me that picture of your copy of Tony Buzan's Embracing Change. And I haven't read that yet, but I'm going to very soon. And I'm excited by the new announcement of the new Tony Buzan book. And uh, that is one of my to-do list things today, to go and order that. If you care about information, order the books by the people who are doing this. It's only through your support that it's possible at all. And uh, if you can even ask your libraries to order these books, that's also great. And uh, I just would make one last suggestion, that you really get yourself a copy of The Diary of a Bookseller, because this is, as I said before, a this is memory lit, tour de force. Very, very, very valuable. Let me know in the comments later. I'm going to close this off for now. But uh, if you like uh, mind map videos, go watch that mind map video. I'm thinking of doing this one next. It's called The Reputation Game, making my mind map and sharing it. But I want to know that you enjoy it. So let me know and let me know what else you might like to see. Brent says, thanks, Anthony. Great live stream. Thank you so much for the super chat and for uh, the great compelling questions and contributions. I really appreciate that. That's part of what makes this all sing and hum along, and I'm very grateful. So thanks, everybody, for today. This was amazing. Thumbs up to all of you. If you haven't visited me at magneticmerrymethod.com, please come and do that. Avail yourself of the training that's there. And it really is as simple as just saying yes to the call to adventure, and I'll keep making it. So thanks again for watching, and until we speak again, Come visit me at magneticmemorymethod.com and keep yourself magnetic. Bye-bye.